All right, so obviously we're starting here in the book of Job, very, very famous passage, and there's a lot that we can learn from the book of Job. We're spending some time in the book of Job, but the, uh, the subject matter, what I want to teach on this morning, uh, entitled my sermon is Coping with Grief and Depression. And, you know, when I was thinking about this sermon, what better place to start than with the book of Job? I mean, you talk about someone who has gone through more than anyone I've ever known. You know, you read this story about Job, and one of the takeaways from the story is that you don't, you know, you can be doing everything right, and that doesn't mean that bad things aren't going to happen to you. I mean, Job was, was the most upright person in the entire world at this time and was doing, I mean, everything right, everything he was supposed to do. It doesn't mean he was sinless and without, you know, without error. But, what, but he, I mean, if you had just looked at everyone alive, it's like, man, Job's the best guy. Imagine being in that position. But still, he was in a position where, where a lot of bad things happened to him and he suffered great loss. So there's many things that he did here that were good that I wanted to be able to learn from and I want us to look at because we all go through hard times in this life. And no matter how straight-laced and good you can be, which obviously we're all stri we're tri striving to do that, we're trying to be as good as we can, I don't want us to have a, a false precept thinking that, well, if I do good, nothing bad's ever going to happen to me. Now, you're going to have bad things happen to you, it, but the good thing is that you can, you can keep some bad things from happening from you. Right? I mean, there's a lot of, of damage and repercussions of getting into sin that's brought upon yourself that brings you misery and sorrow and grief. And you can avoid those pitfalls and avoid those traps. But it doesn't mean that nothing bad is ever going to happen to you if you're doing, even if you're doing what's right. Everyone's going to experience different things. Here we see Job, he experienced persecution. I mean, one of the, one of the, um, the costs of serving God is that that's going to put a big target on your back from the enemy, from the adversary, from Satan and his devil. So right there, you've, you've got potential for having bad things happen in your life, things that will cause grief and things that will cause sorrow. The very first thing that I want to point out when considering all these things, especially as someone who is doing well and doing right, is what Job did not do through all of his all of his trials and in chapter one of course chapter one's bad enough but that's not even the end of his trials and of his gr sources of grief and misery in chapter one we see you know basically he loses all of his goods he loses his oxen he loses um his sheep he loses all of these these physical things but then he loses his children right and, and talk about grief upon grief, like that's, you know, he, I'm sure he would have been just fine losing his whole, all of his finances, his house, everything he physically owned would have been, now he would have traded all of that in, in a heartbeat, everything to never have that again, as long as his children were fine. Of course, that's not what happened. His children are there, the most valuable thing in the world to Job, he, he's lost everything. And in the moment, and, he, and, and not only that, he gets hit with all this stuff just all at once. Yeah. I mean, it's not like, you know, one bad thing happened and then months later something else happened and then months later some other tragedy happened. It's just like, I mean, getting hit by a freight train. I mean, this is just all at once. I can't even imagine, you know, how, how that must feel. And in the moment, in all of that, what does Job say? In verse 20, the Bible says, Then Job arose and rent his mantle, which is something that you do when you're grieving. This is, and this is, this is common culture even w throughout the Bible. You know, you're kind of rip, you tear your clothing, rip your mantle, and shaved his head, fell down upon the ground, and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. This is an extremely strong, profound statement for someone like Job to make. God gives. God is the source. You know, every good gift and every perfect gift cometh from above, from the Father of lights. Okay, He gives us 
what we have. He gives us our life. He gives us our being. He gives us so many good things in this life. But you know what? He can also take away from us. And this is the attitude that we need to maintain that Job has here. And he says, you know what? God is still good. Even though everything has been taken away from me, God is still good. And that last verse says, in all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Amen. Charge God, meaning, meaning God, you're responsible. God, why did you do, did he say, God, why did you do all this to me? Why did he say, no, he said, you know what? God's given to me and God's taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. And that has got to be one of the hardest things to do in this position. Because of everything that happened, and it's, it's so, you know, it's so hard to deal with this, and there's such loss and such grief and sadness at this moment, but being able to maintain uh, the right attitude towards God. Look, I'm starting with this point because this is probably one of the most important points when we have bad things happen in our life. Because when you start getting a bad attitude towards God, it is going to put you down the wrong path and you will not get the comfort and the relief that you're seeking from your grief. You are gonna, you're just going to start going down the wrong way and, and, and none of the rest of this stuff is even going to work that I have in my sermon if you start getting this bad, wrong attitude towards God. It's extremely important that we could try to maintain this right attitude and not try. And look, wouldn't it have been foolish for Job to charge God with doing these things to him when God didn't actually do those things to him, did he? Now, he didn't know. I mean, obviously, he doesn't know what's going on. He didn't know that Satan directly was the one causing all of these things to happen. And you could even see, if, if, look, at his, look at his circumstances. I mean, this great whirlwind came and this house fell. I, like, like these things, don't, you, know, you could say, okay, well, you know, these, these barbarians, these other people came, these robbers came and destroyed his stuff. Okay, you, you could reasonably see how that can just happen. But when you start seeing some of the things that are more supernatural events happening, you could just be like, well, how could this not be God? Right? But you know what? It wasn't. Now, did God allow it to happen? God allowed it to happen. But was God the one doing it against Job? No, he was not. Satan was. Satan was the accuser. Satan was the one, you know, charging against Job that Job was going to um, basically not keep his integrity and that Job would, would you know, because God's given Job as an example. And Satan's trying to say, well, no, you know, oh, yeah, he's just, the only reason he's being so good and like that is because you've given him everything. You've blessed him with so much stuff. Take that stuff away from him and he'll curse you. And obviously this is a trying time for Job and he's being tried, but you know what? He comes through like gold. Now, let's um, continue here into chapter 2 because in chapter 2 of course we're going to see more even after he's lost all that he's lost look at verse number 7 because Satan has this conversation with God and, and God's like look he didn't say he didn't do what you said he was going to do right he's, he didn't charge God foolishly he sinned not and he's like, oh, yeah, okay, well, you know, all the things that he has, whatever, but if you, but if you actually hurt his health and you, you, know, and, and you, you know, physically harm him, then, then he'll curse you, right? And this is, this is Satan's uh, retort. Look at verse number 11. So we're going to, or excuse me, verse number 7. So, so God allows Satan again, once again, to attack Job. And verse 7 says, so when Satan, so went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. So from head to toe, he's got these boils. And he's just got this disease where he's just got, it's just itchy and pussy and, you know, just, just head to toe covered. And he took him a potsherd to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. I mean, things are so bad for Job now. Even, you know, his wife says unto him, verse number nine, then says his wife unto him, dost thou still retain thine integrity because up to this point what does it mean when it says when she says you still retain your integrity because he's not charging god foolishly 
He's not blaming God for everything that happened. She's like, look at all the stuff that happened. Now you got this great disease. You're still going to hold your integrity. And she says, curse God and die. What miserable <laughs> advice to give. I mean, look, curse God. No, that's the last thing that anybody should be doing is cursing God. And Job even, I mean, if you needed something to tip you over the edge, how about your partner, the person, you know, the woman who's given birth to the children that you have with you, you know, and, and shared in your life and all this goods, telling you to curse God, that very well in itself could be a tipping point to just be like, you know what, you're right. And a bad influence here, but he still doesn't do it. He still does what's right. Verse 10 says, But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lips. This is the attitude we need to maintain. And another reason for going into this story is no matter what you are going through, what level of grief and misery, think on Job and the, and, and the ability that he had to be able to stay faithful to the Lord and maintain the right attitude towards God and not charging God and blaming God foolishly. Because I, I'll tell you, I, I think one of the reasons this is even in here is to be able to help all of us because we all deal with things. And it's easy for someone to say, well, you don't understand what I'm going through. What I'm going through is a lot worse. Yeah, you might be able to have strength to get through and not charge God, but not me because you don't understand all the things that happen. Well, you know what? Say that to Job. Right. Try saying that to Job with whatever it is that you have to deal with. Say that to Job. I think he's in here as an example of something that's like, well, I mean, what more is, is going to top everything that this man had to deal with and all the bad influences? And then on top of that, he's got his friends, his buddies. Not only does his wife tell him, hey, just curse God. Then his friends come in and instead of comforting him, they start telling him, well, all this stuff is happening because of you, Job. Where's your sin? Okay, uh, you did. What, well, you must have done something, Job. What is it? And they start rebuking him and telling him that he's a sinner and all this stuff and that none of this stuff would be happening if it wasn't for him. And they start bringing up his kids and everything else. And it's just like, good night. What? You know, it just doesn't ever seem to end. And obviously it does. And we know the end of the story. And we know that God blesses Job. Okay. But we need to remember these things when we go through our own trials and, and just store that in your mind. Maybe you're not going through anything right now. You don't have any problems. Everything's great. You've got a lot of joy. You're not dealing with the grief. Keep this locked in your mind so that you can, you can pull on this as a, as a source of strength to help you to get the strength that you need. Because I'll tell you what, Job like any other prophet, like any other great man of God or great woman of God or a great person in the Bible is still just a human being. Job is not some super person that has great genetics that just is predisposed to be, have more faith and strength than you. He is flesh and blood, just like you are. Just like you are. We all have the same capacities to have faith in God. We do. And it all comes down to you and how are you going to, uh, where are you going to place your faith? Are you going to trust God? Don't blame a bunch of, of history and things that happened in your past on why you can't have the strength to trust God. Everybody can. Everybody can equally. Okay, God has given that measure unto us. He's a human being. He had all this stuff happen, yet he still did it. Why? Because he's retaining integrity. You could have integrity too. Job, Job doesn't have any gift of integrity above anyone else. It's something that he's decided, though, that he's going to retain his integrity. He's going to trust in God, and that would be foolishness to think otherwise. You need to make that decision for yourself because in the tough times and the hard times, it's going to help you. It's going to help you get through. Even if you can't see it, even if you don't understand completely, especially during 
the whirlwind during the time when everything bad is happening maintain that faith because in the end it works good and job maintained that faith because he understood the end of a matter he understood the resurrection there's that passage and i don't have the exact reference uh, memorized where he says you know yet in my flesh you know the worms destroy this body and eat this body he said yet in my flesh he's going to see the lord he knew there's going to be a resurrection he knew there's going to be a better time he knew that god is a savior and god is a strength and god is good he knew all that now one of the things that that you should also do to that will help that should help coping with grief and depression and sadness is Find comfort in friends. Amen. That's good. Okay, you don't have to take everything on yourself. There is a virtue of being strong. There's a virtue of, 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 of you know, being able to, to handle things. But I'll tell you what, friends are there for a reason. You have friends in this church. You have friends maybe outside of this church. You have family members. You know, one of the, one of the great things that they can do is help you during your time of need and don't ever think that you're too uh you know when, when you go through times like this that you're so i don't want to call necessarily proud but but you know that you can't ask for help or, or have people come and and give you some comfort because it is, uh, it is good. The Bible says here let, let's look at verse number 11 and you know what a good friend by the way also will not wait to, to be asked, but will offer their services, okay? And, and, you know, a good friend, it doesn't mean you're going to be intrusive on somebody. You know, some people may not want you there, and, and it's understandable, but don't wait for them to speak to you. Go and, 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 and be forthcoming and, and offer the advice, because sometimes people can be so grieved or so sad, they might not even want to talk to anybody, but if you can... You know, they, they might not even think to, to ask for anything unless you are forward enough to say, hey, we're here for you. What can we do? I want to help you. And if you're in that position, you know, take the help. The Bible says here, and this, and this is where, you know, Job's three friends, it started off with good intentions. And this was the right motivation. Look at verse number 11. The Bible reads, Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that was come upon him, they came every one from his own place, and you know what? They stopped what they were doing because they were actually being friends to Job. Now, what they ended up saying to him was wrong and they get rebuked for it. But they, I mean, they were his friends and they were stopping what they're doing to come and see him. Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuite and Zophar the Namathite. For they had made an appointment together to come to mourn with him and to comfort him. And oftentimes, you know, as a friend, you don't necessarily need to do anything other than just be there for them. And they should have just kept their original plan of mourning him, mourning with him and comforting him instead of, you know, starting to get into, well, you know, Job and try and rebuke him. You know, at, at a point like this, people don't need the rebukes. They've experienced enough. They don't need you to start pointing out their problems when they've been destroyed. Okay, they, he's already been brought down. I think Job is pretty low at this point. I don't think he needs people just starting to point out, you know, problems and sin. It's like, look, man, he's, <laughs> can, you, can you just be a friend to him and, and mourn with him and comfort him? And that's what they came to do. Verse 12 says, And when they lifted up their eyes far off and knew him not, so they, they could look at him, but it just, I mean, they're like, that doesn't look like Job at all because of the disease and everything else. They just look at him like, wow. Wow, I can't even recognize him. It says they lifted up their voice and wept and they rent everyone's mantle and sprinkled dust upon their heads toward heaven. So they sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights and none spake a word unto him for they saw that his grief was very great. And again, understandably so. But this is a job that friends ought to take on themselves is to be there for people and you know what they could have been good comforters to him and helped him through this time instead of what they actually did flip over to chapter 16 
because this is now after they start opening up their mouth and, and rebuking him and stuff. Job answers some of their rebukes in verse number one of Job 16. The Bible says, Job answered and said, I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters are ye all. Shall vain words have an end? Or what emboldeneth thee that thou answerest? I also could speak as ye do, if your soul were in my soul's stead. I could heap up words against you and shake mine head at you. But I would strengthen you with my mouth, and the moving of my lips should assuage your grief. Though I speak, my grief is not assuaged, and though I forbear, what am I eased? So he's basically saying, look, if the roles were reversed, and you were in my shoes, and you were suffering all this stuff, I could just as easily heap up a whole bunch of words against you and go on the attack just like you're going against me. But he said, you know what? I wouldn't do that to you. I would actually be a real friend unto you. I would strengthen you with my mouth, and the moving of my lips should assuage your grief. And that is the right way that a friend ought to be when someone is going through a hard time. It's not the right time. It's not appropriate to start bringing up all the well, you know, you know, maybe if you weren't doing this, or maybe if you didn't do that, or maybe if you watch your kids better, or maybe if you do, you know, then this one all happen. Look, that's not what a friend's for at that point. Now, I just preached last week, or was last week on, on maybe two weeks ago, on, on, you know, being able to tell people, you know, a friend that loves is going to tell people about their sins and stuff. But I also mentioned doing it tactfully and appropriately. And when people just have their life destroyed and devastated, that's not the right time. It's not the right time. It's not appropriate. When someone loses somebody, and you know what? Maybe they did something that's their fault, but you know what? When someone just loses some, like a family member or something and potentially could have been the result of some sin, that is not the right time to start bringing that up. As a friend, that's, they don't need that right then. Because you think they probably hadn't already thought about that anyways. If you're going to be a friend to someone and they're going through such severe grief and trauma and, and, and these trying times, be a friend to them. Strengthen them so that you can assuage their grief. You can deal with maybe some, some other correction later on at another point. But when, when you're in the thick of it, like Job was, it's not the time to do it. It's not the right time. It's inappropriate. Be there for them and strengthen them. Friends ought to actually comfort. The Bible says, uh, turn if you would to uh, Psalm 6. In Proverbs 25, verse 11, the Bible reads, A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. So saying the right words at the right time can mean all the difference. It really can. Words can do a lot. You, you, you know, we always try to, you, you, you may think like, well, what can I actually do? And you think like someone's going through a hard time. What can I do? I want to do something to help. Sometimes all you need to do is just use the right words. Sometimes it's, it's that simple because a word fitly spoken is like apples of golden picture. It, it, can, it can do so much to help. Right timing, right words, help strengthen that person. And oftentimes... That's really what people need in their time of grief anyways. It's not as much what are the physical things I can do to help as much as just help that person emotionally, help that person be strengthened. That's the, the most important thing. I mentioned this briefly when we were looking at Job. You're in Psalm 6. But we can have hope in our grief. And, you know, again, I, I, I forgot to mention this at the beginning, and it's going to come up a little bit later, but there's a lot of causes, a lot of things that can cause us to be in grief and to have sorrow and, and to have sadness. And some of them may be self inflicted, some of them may not be. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into, you know, because there's going to be different ways of how you handle that and things that can help based on what the particulars are. I, I'm trying to be a little bit more generic for the scope of this sermon, of just dealing with grief in general and maintaining that hope. Just as, as Job 
you know, regardless of it being Satan attacking him or whatever, it was, um, you know, him being able to maintain that faith is what was able to provide him with the hope to get through, even when everyone was against him. We've been going through the Psalms, and we'll see that here again in Psalm 6, this, this theme of that even if your mother and father are against you, even if everybody leaves you and forsakes you, God will not forsake you, and God will be there for you. Job is a great example of that. He lost his family, his wife was against him, and his friends were against him, yet God was still with him, and he made it through. And that was enough. Now, was he perfect? No. Does God end up still giving him a rebuke? He does. We could see that, you know, when, when, when God's just, just telling him, hey, where were you? And, you know, he doesn't know everything. But he also says that he was right in the things that he said concerning God and his friends were wrong. And Job was justified by God at that point as well, just in general on, on what he did. So he, he wasn't a perfect person, but, um, but he did maintain his, his faith in God. And that is enough to help strengthen him, even when everything seems to be going against you and you don't seem to have any support. Psalm 6.6, 6, the Bible says, I am weary with my groaning all the night. Make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. Does this sound like some, some sadness? I mean, just a little bit? Weary, like, he's like, I'm physically exhausted and tired with my groanings. Right? Just, just the groaning from the sorrow and the sadness. All the night make I my bed to swim. That's the amount of tears that are coming out of his eyes. He's, he's you know, obviously being real illustrative here, but his bed is swimming. I water my couch with my tears. Mine eye is consumed because of grief. It waxeth old because of all mine enemies. So he's, I mean, this is, this is going through some really, really hard grieving times, right? Verse 8. Now, his may be more because there's just people against him and people attacking him, right? That, that might be more the, the context for here. But it doesn't matter when you go through all these times. Look at what he says. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquities, for the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord hath heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. And as a believer, you know, you can have that comfort of knowing that God is there for you. And all of your weeping, you know what? God hears your weeping. God's there for you. And God, in due time, will get you through whatever it is that you're going through. Maintain that hope in Him. And it doesn't mean that you're just instantly going to not have grief anymore, not have uh, sorrow. Of course, it can maintain. But you know what? God will get you through. And in the end, as you get through, you'll realize uh, how much God actually has done for you, uh, uh, even during these times where you think that He's not. And you can use that to strengthen you and to give you hope that, you know what, it may feel like everything's against me. It may feel like God's not there, but you have to know that he is. Knowing that he is will give you that strength. I spoke with someone a while, a while ago, a month, a couple months ago, a month or two ago, and, and someone going through extreme, extreme grief. And I felt for him. I mean, it was horrible what, what all the, the events surrounding what they had to deal with and stuff. And it, one of the things he said was just kind of like, well, it just doesn't feel like God's, God's with me. I just feel like I'm, I'm praying and, and not having my prayers answered. And this is a, a, good, a really good person, a really good family, re, you know, strong Christian. It can happen, it, and, and it does happen to people. But even in those, those low points and having that feeling, right? Don't rely, because this isn't easy because you may be overwhelmed with grief, but try to maintain the knowledge from God's word to strengthen you through that grief, to know that that. Don't, don't allow the emotion to win out over you, over what you know from the, from the, of the Lord, from the Bible. That you may feel like he's not hearing you. You may feel like you've been forsaken, but you could know based on the sure words of Scripture that we have that you're not forsaken, that he does hear you, and that, and that don't, don't let that feeling consume you 
to eat up your strength. You could gain the strength knowing that God does hear you. And this is how we see when people are having this level of grief, this is how they maintain and get through it. This is the way. This is the path. Job exhibited that. He knew that God was there. He knew that God is righteous. He knew that God is good through all of it. And David saying the same thing. It doesn't matter what his circumstances are. It doesn't matter how many people are against him. It doesn't matter how sad he is. He, says he knows that God is still there and God is still hearing my prayers. He may not be seeing it at the moment, but he knows that. And we need to have that level of faith to know that God is there and just think back and remember, no, I know that God's going to hear me. I know God's hearing my weeping. I know he's with me. Turn if you would to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. I'm going to go over this point real quickly. I mentioned, you know, the hope of a resurrection is always there. Job mentioned that. We see in, um, in John 16, I'm going to read these passages for you. John 16, verse 20, the Bible reads, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your, sh your sorrow shall be turned into joy. And obviously, you know, this, this in context, is talking about Jesus Christ's death, right? And saying, hey, the world's going to rejoice, and you're going to be sad but your sorrow is going to be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. This is also a good um, just bit of wisdom to remember. When, when your hours come, your hour of grief, right? Your, your moments of, of, of severe um, depression and, and grief and sorrow, know that it's that it will pass and that when you're delivered of that sorrow and that grief then there's gonna be no more anguish and ultimately at the end of the day no matter how long that that grief and suffering endures there is still an end you say I don't feel like this is ever gonna end for the rest of my life well it will because there's gonna be a day where our bodies are gonna be changed there's gonna be a resurrection for us Jesus said in verse 22, And ye now, therefore have, ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. And we're going to see Jesus in a day, and we're going to be, you know, any sorrows and any sadness and any grief that you have in this life is going to be washed away. And when you see him as he is, and, and you are in the presence of the Lord, you will not. Ha I mean, so no matter the extent. Now, I think for the vast majority of people, your grief is still going to be relatively short term. I'm not saying it's, it ever just completely goes away 100%. But when you're in that severe level of grief and sorrow, that is, that is going to be temporary. But in the end of everything, there's going to be joy in the presence of our Lord and you won't have that grief anymore. So ultimately, it's, always, it's all temporary for us. 1 Thessalonians, 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, the Bible reads, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. And again, this is another source of comfort. I just wanted to bring this up because obviously death is something that brings all of us sorrow when someone close to you dies. But we have this great amount of hope that for everyone who's saved, I mean, hey, God's going to bring them with him, just like you. And we're going to see them again, and we're with them again, and it's a temporary parting. It's not a permanent thing for everyone who's saved, whether, whether it's um, you know, someone who's received Christ as their Savior or, or you know, children, infants, that feel people who are, who are smaller, that, that the Bible records very clearly that, you know what? They're not sinners. They didn't have any sin that they've committed they need to be forgiven of. The innocent souls are going to go and be with the Lord. And, um, and that's also comforting as well. And we know that, that just as Jesus died and rose again, them which sleep in Jesus, God will bring with them. Now, I had you turn to Hebrews chapter 4, because I think there's another powerful point to bring, to bring home, is who, who our God is 
should add another layer of comfort. And knowing that you're not alone in your grief. Job wasn't alone in his grief. Everyone may have turned against him, but he wasn't alone in his grief because of who God is. Look at verse number 14 in Hebrews chapter 4. The Bible re reads, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. God knows everything about what we go through in this world. He's not a distant God that doesn't understand our sufferings, doesn't understand our pain, doesn't understand our sorrow, doesn't understand grief. He understands it fully, completely, through Jesus Christ, who actually lived a human existence in this life. I mean, I, I already believe that God already has the knowledge and would know what it's like, but it's like he even proves it through Jesus Christ being born and going through everything that he went through and experiencing every single thing for himself on what we go through. And talk about someone who's had people against him and someone who's experienced a lot of grief and sorrow and physical pain and discomfort and hunger and thirst and everything else. And he went through all of it, yet without sin. Look at verse number 16, though. I, I love this. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We can boldly go to the throne. We can boldly go to Jesus with your problems, with your grief, with your source of, of, of sorrow, and, and boldly come and find grace to help in time of need. Because he understands, he knows, and he's not going to just leave you high and dry. Don't run away from God. Don't turn from God. Don't charge God foolishly. Go to God. Seek God for his help. Seek God for his grace. He knows what you're going through, and he can help. That is where you need to turn. Yeah, it's great to have friends, and, and I encourage that. And I think friends should be friends and help people in their time of need and grief. But you know what? You can do it without anyone, ultimately, with God. Amen. Jesus was a man of sorrows. Turn, if you would, to... Um, turn, if you would, to Proverbs 23. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, which is a very prophetic passage about Jesus Christ, Isaiah 53, verse 3, says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. You're talking about some sorrow and grief. Jesus Christ went through a lot of sorrow and grief. While he was God in the flesh, you know what? He still was a man. And when people despise you and reject you, that's not like, hey, that makes me real happy that everybody hates me and is against me and wants to kill me when all I'm trying to do is good. That's going to be a source of sorrow and grief. And people just, they're hiding their faces from them like, oh man, I don't even want to look on him. To be that much of an outcast? And on top of that, verse 4 says, Surely he hath borne our griefs. He bears our griefs. He's taken it on his shoulders. The weight that we carry can be put on Jesus Christ. He bears our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He's done that for us, and people still despise him. That is sorrow upon sorrow. He knows what it's like. But we see here, you know what? He did bear our griefs for us. And he carried our sorrows. Let's turn to him. I'm going to read for you from Ecclesiastes 7. The Bible reads in verse number 1, A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning 
than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. And you see, Pastor Reverend, why are we turning this passage? Well, one, there's a lot to learn from this passage. And where the Bible says sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. It's important to understand that grief and sorrow is not a bad thing. And the reason why I say that is because the world today is going to try to tell you that, oh, you're sad. Oh, you have sorrow. Oh, you have grief. Take this pill. Take this drug. Because we don't want you just to be sad. You, you need to just be happy all the time. You know what? It's okay to have grief. It's okay to have sorrow. And it's something that we all have to go through and deal with. And it's not the most pleasant thing. But you know what? It still is good for you. There's a lot of things that are good for us as people that end up being good in the long run for you as a person that are not pleasant to have to deal with at the time. Case in point, the disciplining of, of children when they receive that spanking, is, is, it's not fun to go through that at the time, but you know what? It's good for them. It's going to help them become a better person. And grieving here, the Bible says, sorrow is better left or the sadness of the countenance, the sadness of your face, by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. And when you're grieving, again, it's going to be harder to understand these things, but it, in, the, in the long run, that grief and that sorrow that you go through and that trial and, and, and everything that you're bearing and dealing with, in the end, is going to end up being better for you and strengthening you and is going to be good for your heart. And you know why I know this? Because the Bible says so. And you can see it anecdotally. You can see, well, what good is the house of mirth, right? The people just, it's all about fun. It's all about partying. It's well, everything I can do just to feel good, feel good, feel good. It doesn't work. It ends up just being a facade. I went down that road. It's empty and vain. It's not real joy. <laughs> you know, actually, it ends up bringing grief and sorrow in misery. That's right. and, and it's kind of this, this perpetual cycle that you could get yourself involved in is trying to seek that happiness and be in that house of mirth. You know what? Why don't you just go through, try not to mask, you don't have to mask the pain. You have to go through it. You go through the grief and the sorrow and, and go through it with God, with your Savior. Let Him be with you the whole time. Let him give you the strength that you need. And when you get through it, the heart is going to be made better. Verse number four says, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. The wise. It's okay to go through mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. You don't need medications because you're sad. I'm against all medications for depression, for sadness, for grief, all of it. Do not find that concept in the scripture at all. I do think it could be a real problem for people. I do believe depression is real. People get real sad and, and, and have these problems and, and, and it could be debilitating with the amount of grief and sorrow they have. I know that it's real, but the solution that's being provided by the world is wrong. Right. It is not a chemical imbalance. It is not some physical thing that you just need to take this or eat this or do this drug. That's no different than people just, you know what, drinking their sorrows away. Right? right? I'm going to drown out my sorrows. You heard that before? Yeah. Does it work? No, it doesn't. For a temporary period, a short term, you're going to act like an idiot and act like a fool and think you're real happy. Right? And you could go out and say stupid things and dance around and act a fool and not think about the things that are making you sad. But you know what? That ends. And then you're going to wake up in a worse condition than you were before you started. Because now you're going to have the hangover. You're dealing with the effects of the poison in your body. You're going to have to try to think about, oh man, what did I do? What did I say? What kind of filth came out of my mouth? 
Now you're worse off. As you turn to Proverbs 23, look down at verse number 29. Because this, this tells you, you know, people who want to escape sorrow, escape sadness, escape grief by going to some controlled substance or going to alcohol. Look what verse 29 says here. And this is talking about alcohol. Who hath woe, woe is, is misery. Who hath sorrow, again, sorrow. Who hath contentions, it's fightings. Who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause. Who hath redness of eyes. They that tarry long, excuse me, at the wine. They that go to seek mixed wine. The wine brings this stuff. The wine brings the fightings. The wine brings the wounds without, because you say, no, no, it's the people that have the sorrow that go to the wine. No, it's because of the wine that these things happen. That's the way it's worded. It's not saying, oh, well, it's, it's only the people who have sorrow that are going to drink the wine and seeking the wine. It's because they sought the wine, they have these things. Because otherwise, the rest of these verses wouldn't, you know, the rest of the verse wouldn't make sense. Well, who hath wounds without cause? People have wounds without cause or seeking alcohol? No. The alcohol brings the wounds without cause. Right. Because they black out, they don't remember what happened, but they got hurt somehow. The redness of eyes, they don't have the redness of eyes first and then go seek the alcohol. They get the redness of eyes from the alcohol. Just the same way the woe and the sorrow comes from the alcohol. It doesn't solve your problems. Verse 31 says, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent, stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, thine heart shall utter perverse things. Those things do not bring joy to your life. They're not going to fix your grief. They're not going to help you with your sorrow. So that's not going to help. What will help? How can you restore your joy when you're sad? And as I mentioned before, you know, there's going to be some things that may be more specific to your cause of grief. I'm not going to go into all those. I mean, you know, maybe you did something wrong to somebody and that makes you sad. It may, you know, I can't believe I did that to this person. And, you know, making it right with that person, that, that can help with your grief. There, you know, there, there's things like that, right? May, you, you did something wrong against God. You sinned. Well, well repent and, 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 and get right with God, you know, and that can help you with your grief. So there's obviously things um, that are going to that are going to help you specifically with with maybe whatever your source of grief is but I'll tell you what there is one one universal joy restorer there is one thing that will help with this now if you're if you're not right with God you know you got to get right with God and if you don't have your 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 faith in the Lord you know you, you've got to do that that is primary that's number 1 but by and large especially for those who are dealing with longer term grief where someone might be diagnosed with depression, okay, and, and someone's carrying something longer than, than may even be considered normal. Obviously, you know, when, when people die, when people pass, there is, you know, no set time, but that can be a grief that lasts a long time. And you just got to be prepared for that and understand that and know this doesn't just pass right away. You can't just expect people to just get over it in like a week or something. You know, a loved one died, a child died, a friend died, you know, a parent died, a sibling died. Like, many times you can, you can carry that grief and sorrow for a real long time. And that can be, that's expected. But you just gain your strength from the Lord, gain your strength from friends, continue to go through it. But there is a way, because just as with alcohol, people turn to alcohol and drugs because they want to get their mind off of whatever is causing their source of grief. That's the wrong way of doing it because you're just turning basically still to yourself and, and to just this, this idea of having fun. The universal joy restorer is keeping your mind on helping other people. This is huge. And don't let this, get, I mean, this is the other main point of the sermon. Keep your mind focused on helping other people. The Bible says in Acts 20, 35, turn if you would to Philippians chapter 2. It's the last place we'll look at this, this morning. Philippians chapter 2. Acts 20, 35 says, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak. So he said, I want you to, you know, I, I, I've taught you, I've showed you that we need to be laboring and working hard to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. 
You are blessed. You will be blessed when you can give, when you can labor, and you can support the weak. The weak are going to be other people around you that need help. Right? When you can labor and work hard and help someone else, that brings you joy. That brings you blessing. That's going to help you through a grieving time because one, you're not going to be thinking about your loss. You're not going to be thinking of your source of grief. You're not going to be thinking about how you feel and everything about you. You're going to be thinking about somebody else. You're going to be focused on what can I do to help that person? Oh man, they're dealing with this. They're going through this. They have this problem. How can I help them? And if you can actually help that person, that brings you joy. A great example is when you lead somebody to Christ. Doesn't that bring you joy? I mean, who here has experienced joy by being able to lead somebody to Jesus Christ? Because you know that that person was going to hell and that that person's hellbound and you were able to show them the love of God and the love of Jesus and they decided to accept Jesus Christ because of the work that you did for them and you went out and labored for that person and you persuaded them and convinced them and showed them and said, hey, you're exhorting them, get saved. And then they do. Man, does that bring joy. That's great. Hey, isn't it great? This person, this young person, this old person who's about to die, whoever the person is, they're saved. They're saved eternally. That brings joy. But even beyond soul winning and, 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 and that, just helping people. When you help people out that are in need, that brings joy. And when you sacrifice of yourself... And say, you know what? No, I'm, I need. Well, I need to take off work to do that. Well, you take off work, make the sacrifice. It may be a financial sacrifice. It may be a time sacrifice. But you do that because you love someone and you help them out. That's going to bring you joy. And when you can keep that mindset that is not focused on you and is focused on others, that's going to help you with your depression. That's going to help you with your grief. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. What happens with depression is often it becomes this cycle because you focus more and more and more about the bad things, about the things, about your loss, about, about what happened, about what, you know, whatever it is that's causing the grief. You just kind of sit and focus and dwell on that, and that makes you more and more and more sad. But when you get your mind off of that, not by focusing on alcohol, not by focusing on dancing and partying and having fun, but I'm focusing on helping people, the result, the end of doing good is going to be that you're blessed. And don't expect that to work like a drug, just like, oh, I did that once and now I just should be good forever. No, you can still carry that grief with you, but you know what's going to help you to maintain, and you know what, that maintaining of that mindset you're in Philippians chapter 2. That maintaining of that mindset is what we all ought to have anyways. Whether you're sorrowing or not, this is something that we all ought to have anyways. But if we have this, this will help you get through your grief, guaranteed. Verse number 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ. We're being consoled, right? Isn't that what people who are sad want? We better be consoled. We want to receive consolation. If any comfort of love... If any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded. So he's saying, I want you, it, it, you want to have the consolation, you want to have the comfort of love, you want to have these things, then you can fulfill my joy. And, and I mean, there's so much here. He's saying, by you listening to me, by you being like-minded with me, it's actually going to bring me joy. And what's he doing here? He's ministering to the Philippians. He's telling them, how, you know, he's discipling them, he's training them, he's teaching them these great truths. Saying, hey, you want to have this? Well, if you do these things, you're going to get the consolation, you're going to come for love. It's going to make me happy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Do it for the right reasons. Don't do it out of fighting. Don't do it just to get some glory. It's empty and vain to lift yourself up. He says, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. You're having a, hum a humble mind thinking, you know what, that per I need to help that person. You know, you're esteeming them, you're lifting them up more than you. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. If we have that mind about us, 
and we're esteeming others better than ourselves, you know what? That's going to fulfill your joy. It fo that's what the Apostle Paul is saying here. It's going to fulfill his joy if you could have this same mindset where you're thinking on other people. And you know what? When you have this mindset, when you're like-minded, you'll have the consolation in Christ and you'll have the comfort of love. In doing these things, guess what? If you're doing these things, you're walking in the Spirit. And you know what the fruit of the Spirit is? Love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith. Aren't those all the things when you're going through grief and sorrow that you long to have? Two main takeaways to help you during coping with grief and depression. Don't charge God foolishly. Okay? Worship the Lord. No matter what has happened, God is good. God is still good. Maintain that attitude and faith towards God. He'll give you the strength. He'll give you what you need. Okay? Number two, focus on other people. Focus on helping them. Now, it may not be, again, wherever you're at in the, in the point, you may not be capable of doing that. Like, like Job wasn't going to be capable of just going out and helping other people at the moment when all these things happen. I'm not saying, you know, don't, don't put this weird expectation of like, well, now I just got to go off and do this, okay? Go through the grieving period. Go through the process of whatever needs to happen. But you do need to get to the point, especially when it comes to an extended period. Start doing these things. You know, when, you start, when your life starts coming back to normal, Job's life hadn't come back to normal. I mean, he still is dealing with this with a lot of stuff at where we see them in that story, right? But apply it to yourself. As, as your world maybe uh, settles down a little bit and you still have the grief, you still have the sorrow, start focusing on other people. Start thinking, what can I do to help? I mean, it, start with just, maybe just soul winning is, gonna, is a great start. And then, and then, you know, think about other friends and other people and whatever you can do to help, it's going to help you. I mean, even volunteering time somewhere where you're helping people is going gonna, is, is gonna to help. It's, it's going to provide you with some joy and, some, and, and, and comfort. Grief, sorrow, it's something we all have to deal with, but, but uh, I pray that you all will, will, will remember these things, let them sink down, and, and keep them with you as we go forward in this life that they can help you overcome that grief and sorrow. Let's bow our have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the wisdom that you give us in your word and the great stories and examples that we have to learn from. God, I pray that you would please just uh, help us never to, to feel like you're not there. We know that you're there and you hear our prayers, dear Lord, and I pray that you would just help uh, these words and your words, dear Lord, that, that we looked at today to be able to uh, be cemented in our minds and in our hearts so that whatever, whenever the time comes for us individually where we have to deal with sadness and, and sorrow, that, that these things can be brought back into our minds to help us get through them, dear Lord. Uh, we love you. We thank you for sending us the Comforter and the Holy Ghost to also to, to be here with us and that you haven't let us, left us comfortless in this world, dear Lord. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.